What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Den of Geek Presents Marvel Stand Em Live, where each week we give you the deepest possible dives on all the goings on in the MCU, Marvel Comics, and beyond. With me for all time and always, I got Den of Geek TV editor Alec Bajalid and Den of Geek News and Features editor Kirsten Howard. And returning once again, our special guest, pop culture writer and Den of Geek contributor, Merciless Joe George. Thanks for coming back, Joe. Oh, thanks for having me back after <laughs> being on the show last so, week. <laughs> our first stop this week is the long-awaited Thor Love and Thunder trailer, which honestly feels like exactly what the MCU needs right now after what has been a kind of uneven phase four. I love this trailer. This is like, this is just exactly the kind of, you know, MCU technicolor lunacy that I've been looking forward to for a while. Um you know, there's there's some retro vibes to it. I feel like the Thor franchise is becoming the MCU's uh, answer to Mike Hodges' Flash Gordon. I'm very much here for that. There's a little bit of like Big Trouble in Little China in Thor's uh, Ravager look there. Uh, I'm just really feeling this. How, how, what did everybody else think of this trailer? I smiled like an idiot throughout the entire thing. It was just delightful. You know, um, I, I have some plot worries, but it was just, it's nice to see all my friends again. And the use of a sweet child of mine that's been stuck in my head the entire time. That's exactly what I want from this movie. Yeah, it looks great. The vibes on this trailer were a lot more chill than I was expecting, actually. There was, um, yeah, it just seems like Thor is trying to find some peace. He's been through hell. Um, and I love that for him. It's great, right? Um, Taika Waititi said this would be a love story. Um, I didn't get that from this trailer, but <laughs> I assume like most of the stuff we saw here would probably be the first 20 minutes of the movie. And then there's, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff happening. Um, so I'm looking forward to, yeah, digging into it. Hopefully we get a bigger trailer before it comes out, though, because this is quite a short one, wasn't it? I mean, it was really short, but man, I loved every second of it. I think like uh, there was a... Um an onion headline from years ago that said like uh, superhero fans outrage that Iron Man trailer being adapted into feature film. <laughs> I, feel <this> like, <laughs> I feel that way about like this Thor love and thunder trailer. Like if, if all I got from this entire, if they just like spent $200 million making this like 80 second trailer, I would have called it a job well done. Um, <laughs> we get so little of it, but oh man, it just like, it really, tugs at my heartstrings in a weird way i mean i think like 80 percent of that is probably sweet child the mine mm -hmm. um but i i think this trailer kind of reveals maybe what what the mcu has been missing lately which is just kind of like a, a sense of shared history um mm -hmm. like we spent so much time with chris hemsworth as thor and it was it's just like such a monumental relief to see him back doing thor things regardless of how brief it was um, yeah, I'm not usually the kind of person who like, you know, rewatches trailers or rewatches anything like over and over again, but I watched this on a loop like seven times in a row when it first came out. Um, I don't know how to sum it up. Let me say the vibes are just immaculate here. I feel like the choice of Sweet Child of Mine uh, as the trailer song is especially appropriate because when you think about how Thor started off in this world, right, as just like this, you know, brash kind of idiot um and the evolution that we've gotten with this character over i mean this is what going to be the seventh eighth movie that we've spent time with thor in it's wild and the fact that a song like sweet child of mine is on the same album as songs like night train and mr brownstone and welcome to the jungle that in itself i feel is is an appropriate juxtaposition with thor's uh with thor's journey here no this was an immaculate 89 seconds like i don't know if the movie is going to be any good i have to imagine it will be uh you know uh, taika waititi doesn't make bad movies as far as i know um but i i couldn't be happier with this and i feel like any kind of question you know, people had as to where this franchise was headed after Ragnarok is uh, is is pretty emphatically answered here in less than a minute and a half. I do have some concerns that I mean, do you guys think the Guardians are going to be in it for more than one scene? And if that's the case, I feel like we kind of missed out on Thor and the Guardians adventures that were 
sort of promised. I'm going to be a little bum if that's just like the opening and then, you know, all of those friends go away and <laughs> we kind of missed out something interesting off screen. That would be a little bit of a bummer, but maybe I'm just being cynical about that. I don't know. And Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is about to begin filming. Uh, I think it starts filming next month. And I don't know anything as to whether Chris Hemsworth is supposed to show up in that movie as well. But you might be right. Like, you know, on the other hand, you don't want, you know, you don't want the Guardians to overshadow Thor and his journey here. And you also don't want, I mean, like, understandably so, like James Gunn is quite protective of these characters and their arcs. So I think I think there's only so much time we can spend with them here. But I'm into it, especially the uh, the crush that Thor seems to have developed on uh, on Star Lord. This shot of him leaning in is just already so iconic. Like it's a meme, you know, already. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just perfect, isn't it? I just can't believe how good Chris Hemsworth is at his job. Like, yeah, what a fun. Yeah. He's he just like he does absolutely everything. He's so funny. He looks like an action figure. Mm -hmm. It was just like he was put on earth to, to be in these superhero movies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always reminded of the first time I saw the first Thor movie and the moment where he's walking through the halls of Asgard and being greeted triumphantly by everybody. And he's just like flipping his hammer and he's all but high-fiving the crowd. You know what I mean? And I was like, this guy, I don't know if this guy is a great actor, but he sure is the only person who could possibly play this character, you know? And over the years, we've seen that he's a far better comedic actor than anybody would have expected. Um, and I love that they're leaning into it here, you know? And, and it's completely believable. I mean, if you play Thor too straight, you know, I mean, look, that's a, go see the Northmen. You know what I mean? Like, go see, like, there's plenty of, you want, you want serious Viking action. There's two TV series about that. You know, go, by all means, read the Jason Aaron comics that, that they're taking inspiration from for this. If there's plenty of opportunities, if you want, like, serious, like, you know, warrior, mead drinking, you know, villager screwing Thor. Like there's plenty of that out there and there's plenty of ways you can get that in other non-Marvel media as well. But like, I'm totally here for this goofball and I can't help but feel that they put that moment in with Thor and star -Lord, like specifically in this trailer, just to give Florida governor Ron DeSantis and other assorted bigots diarrhea. Like, I just can't help but feel that this was such a deliberate statement by Disney uh, about like all of the nonsense discourse that is going on around Disney in general and particularly in the state of Florida right now. And I'm here for it. Like maybe this scene doesn't even appear in the movie and it's just like <laughs> here in this trailer to annoy people. Like, I love that. Like I'm, I'm very much here for it. It's like, it's like take a, took a break from whatever, you know, whatever debauchery he was engaging in just to, just to tweak people's <laughs> noses. Like I'm, I'm totally down. Speaking of um, making Ron DeSantis mad and also screwing villagers, <laughs> he, he, Thor just like makes out with a space pirate in this trailer. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> what a delight. What a delight. Look at him go. I don't know who that is. And this looks like an animated romance co novel cover. You know, <laughs> like, I ha like, I almost have to wonder if this is like part of a dream sequence, you know, where Thor is envisioning his life, you know, away from superheroing, you know? Like, I have no idea what's going on in that two and a half seconds in the trailer. And I love it. I totally love it. I <laughs> It reminds me of um, these movies that my kids make me watch called The Descendants. I don't know why. There's a lot of... Oh, Joe no Joe and Joe knows, yeah. Yes. There's a lot of musical sequences like that. And I think there's like a pirate girl with blue hair and it... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they better not give us space pirates that aren't the star jammers, though. I mean, I know we're a little bit off before them, but if you're going to do space pirates, Marvel already has red space pirates. I am a hundred percent down though. Now that you mention it, like for like our back door into corners of the X-Men universe being the star jammers, you know, like once, once yeah. James Gunn wraps the, uh, wraps his guardians trilogy. <laughs> oh, that would be rad. Alec, I'm sorry. Where, was I talking over you a moment ago? You were talking over the stupidest joke anybody would ever hear <laughs> and it's best left in the past. 
<laughs> well, now uh, I've got to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just literally mumbled under my breath uh, that feeling when no blue hair, no, no blue haired space pirate girlfriend. <laughs> 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 the moment it escaped my lips, I was so glad Joe talked over it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. As a as a dad, I never want to take away anybody else's dad joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the, the big notable omission from this trailer is there's still no sign of Christian Bale's big villain. And Christian Bale is playing a character named Gore the God Butcher. Uh, who is exactly as terrifying as that black metal ass name makes him sound. And you know what? I'm kind of cool with it. Like, I'm kind of cool that they just went with the good vibes in this trailer and they're saving the genuine menace of gore for, you know, for a longer trailer, you know, down the line. What I'm really curious about, though, for anybody who has read the comics that, you know, they're taking some inspiration from for this movie. Those are some dark comics. And like, we see straight up, like an, like, like an almost like line for line recreation of a scene from Thor God of Thunder number three in this trailer. Um, and it's pretty dark. Like what's happening there is that's not just some random dead beast. That is a dead God. Like that is a dead cosmic God. And what's happening is Thor is kind of following this trail of dead gods through the universe as he's tracking Gore. At some point, obviously, you know, uh, Lee in the comments just says, you think Gore is eating all of Mount, at Mount Olympus? Uh, yes, I absolutely think he is. Like, I think there will be, there will be some carnage on Olympus when we get there. But that comic is nasty. Like, particularly that that initial gore arc is like, what, 12, 12 issues? Like, it's two full graphic novels. It's awesome. It is so good. It's one of the best Thor stories ever written. But I don't know how that vibe is going to translate to, uh, you know, to this movie with the good vibes that we're getting here. Am I the only one here who has read this? No, Joe, you must have read those comics as well. Yeah, I've read them and I and I share your concern. I'm I'm, I'm kind of already compartmentalizing, you know, that the comics are going to be its own thing. The, the the God Butcher arc is amazing and I will always have it, you know, to, to read and this is going to be something totally different. You know, it's it's I don't expect you know, this is going to be I'm going to have to be like the the hardcore Iron Man fans watching Iron Man 3 and then, you know, they get that version of the Mandarin and they're all upset about it. You know, we're just going to have to understand that this is going to be the MCU version of the God Butcher. It's totally going to be totally different. And that's totally OK, because we still have the comics and they're their own thing. But yeah, I expect I, I can't see just from the little clips that we get of Russell Crowe's Zeus in in this that looks like, you know, Flash Gordon, the Apple or something, you know, crazy 80s, uh, 70s movie. I cannot see the God Butcher from the comics showing up into that version of Mount Olympus and just <laughs> tearing people apart. It's it's going to be totally, totally different. So I, I think those of us that are fans of the comics need to prepare ourselves now for something totally different. And speaking of completely intentional homoeroticism we are going to olympus in this movie which makes me wonder if we're gonna get if we're gonna get the mcu version of hercules finally introduced here because mm -hmm. hercules in the comics is a lot of fun in fact mcu thor really personality wise is much more like marvel comics hercules than he is marvel comics thor you know so i wonder how they're gonna play that maybe they'll maybe they'll flip the script and when we get hercules he'll be the more kind of serious warrior type you know, while our Thor is the is the kind of, you know, drunken party boy lout, you know, but I'm totally ready for uh, for Hercules and Thor on the big screen. I'm sure that Russell Crowe is going to make a complete meal out of uh, out of Zeus. Just look at that shot. Come on. <laughs> like, <laughs> like how can how can anybody not be hyped to see Russell Crowe like just having the time of his life in this? So we haven't got long to wait until this comes out either, really, when you think about it. Yeah, they sure took their sweet time. This movie is out July 8th. Um, and we haven't even gotten to the biggest reveal of the trailer, which is Jane Foster is Thor now. And Natalie Portman is 
ridiculously jacked like <laughs> like that shot is so awesome like that is one of the coolest reveals of all time in an mcu trailer i, I just wanted, like how so much like... to hit me with a uh, hammer that, that's <laughs> cool. really want her to just murder me with it that's fine <laughs> i hope that's the vibe they were going for <laughs> might have been <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the look on <laughs> Thor's face, I think that's kind of the vibe B wants too. Aesthetically, like this whole movie and everything in the trailer looks like it's like happening on the side of like a panel van, right down to just like supremely Jack Natalie Portman. The, the, the aesthetics are so on point. It just all looks so cool. I think maybe that's why I'm, I'm so buzzing over the whole thing. But you know what? It's that's That's a perfect way to describe it. And that is kind of Marvel Comics appropriate as well, because... The God Butcher arc, the the art all through that, it is it is like a black metal album cover. You know what I mean? And it really reflects like the tone of everything. But when you get to the Jane Foster is now the Mighty Thor stuff and the art is by Russell Dodderman, it really does change into something more kind of like, you know, 70s, 80s paperback fantasy novel cover art, you know, uh, yeah, rock and roll, uh, you know, high school van, airbrushed panel uh, art. Like, I really, really dig that. So it's uh, it's pretty appropriate. And I do think, I have my suspicion, you can't really tell, but in that shot where we see Jane Foster, there's all these like slimy kind of tentacly kind of things happening in the background. Those might be Gore's minions, the Black Berserkers. Like, I would not be entirely surprised if that is something uh, Gore-related there. But it's that's purely speculation on my part. I know nothing. I'm actually interested because I haven't read these comics. How does she find out that she can wield Mjolnir? Because my thought initially was that this would be a multiverse version of Thor, but considering the stage we're in but that's not the case in the comics surely so could you explain if you know um how that actually happens well at the start of, they teased that very early in jason aaron's arc where it's revealed that jane foster is like has cancer and thor is like look i'll do whatever you know, and she's like, no, I'm like, no magic to heal me. Like, you're not taking me to Asgard. Like, you're not going to trick me into drinking any magic potions. Like, I'm a human. This is how humans deal with stuff. I'm going to get through this, you know. And then over the course of this adventure, you know, Thor becomes, you know, the unworthy Thor. And then Jane ends up uh, wielding Mjolnir. And I don't know how they're going to go with this here. You know, I'd be curious to see if they try for something relatively heavy. You know, again, there's there's some real like vibe clashes between the comics and and the screen here. Um, and I have complete faith in this creative team, but I um, I want to see how they do it. But I don't think it'll be a multiverse thing. But maybe it will be. Who knows? I'm, I'm a little worried that um, that they will make Thor unworthy again, since, you know, the I'm still worthy part from Endgame was so resonant yes. that it would be a real bummer to, to, to walk that back. And because original sin was such a terrible story <laughs> from the comics, I don't want them to work any of that in either. So I didn't consider multiverse Jane, but now that you mentioned that Kirsty, I, I, I almost prefer that uh, to, to any of the other options that we've seen on the table so far. Although it could just be as simple as like, look, he's he said he's walking away from all this, and you know somebody has reconstituted Mjolnir after hell after hell destroyed it. So I'm I'm here for it. I love not knowing the answers. You know, I love like being like, yes, these are objectively the comics that are inspiring this movie or TV series, and I still have no idea what's going on. You know, like it's just way better that way. It's funny you say that, Mike, because we're about to talk about an episode of Moon Knight a bit like that, right? Yes, but before we do that, we're going to take a <laughs> short break because we kind of, kind of, sort of have Ethan Hawke guesting on the show. Not really, but we do have something really cool with Ethan Hawke that, uh, that nobody else has. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back to talk about Moon Knight. Oh. 
I don't know what they are. And I, I remember the first professional acting job I had was The Explorers. Uh, one for one. One for one. <laughs> and next was Dead Poet Society. And that's not There's what they are. There's one in the middle. There's one in the middle. It's a short. What is it? From 1988 called Lion's Den. Oh, Lion's Den. <laughs> Lion's Den's a short student film that... Um, that I did with some friends from high school. Actually, Brian Singer directed it and Christopher McQuarrie uh, wrote it, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. But anyway, that was a short film, so I didn't get paid. I think I had to pay to make it, so that's different. <laughs> uh, and um, So Dead so, Poet Society, you got that. You got two okay, more. That, I mean, two next, more. Next would be Dad. Next is Dad. Jack Lemmon film. 1989. All right, then next would be hard for me. Okay, so I did Dad, and I came home, and then Dead Poet Society came out. Wife Fang. Got it. You're five for five. You're the first person to ever go five for five. Congratulations, <laughs> Ethan Hawk. Thank you. Welcome back to Denny Geek Presents Marvel Standing Live. I am still Mike Cicchini, and I still have Alec Bajalid and Kirsten Howard and Joe George with us. That was handsome Chris Longo there, our director of editorial and partnerships, and my fellow New York Mets fan at Denny Geek uh, interviewing Ethan Hawk there for first five. Um, but now we're talking about Moon Knight episode four, folks. Kirsty, why don't you tell us what happened? I mean, I'll try, but I think we both know it's a bit of a task. If you've seen the episode, I will try though. Um, in the fourth episode of Moon Knight, Stephen and Layla head to the site of Amit's tomb, where Arthur Harrow tells Layla that Mark knows more about her father's death than he's letting on. But Layla confronts Mark and Arthur shoots him dead. Mark then falls into a kind of oblivion and wakes up in a mental institution where he is surrounded by elements of the Moon Knight story to date, including Harrow, who in this reality appears to be Mark's therapist. As the episode ends, Mark and Stephen abruptly meet the Egyptian goddess Taweret, I'm ho hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, as a new Id identity inside Mark struggles to emerge. I'm going to I'm going to throw this to George first, because, uh, Joe, you are the like. You are the resident Moon Knight defender here, and I need to know what you see in this episode. I don't know that I'm the resident Moon Knight defender. I just have taste. I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's <laughs> I, what I see in this episode is is tomb raiding. I see a cool looking uh Cool looking practical effect monster. I see Layla sticking a flare in the head of the monster like she's Michael Myers. And then I see a hard cut to uh, uh, my my favorite Moon Knight run. I mean, all of, all of this episode worked for me. I think Layla continues to be delightful. Um, Steven is doing smart, useful things in this episode. He's solving puzzles. He's interpreting things. That's good stuff. Um, uh, we get more kind of drops to the backstory. I think visually this one looks really good. I, I, I love all of it. I, I really, I, I'm not even trying to be contrarian. I, I can't see, um, at least yet, what I've heard about the complaints. I, I don't see them. Every part of the episode works for me. I will say, in your defense, uh, almost everything that you just mentioned are all things that I love about this episode, too. And initially, on my first viewing, when we had the screeners, like, you know, critics got four episodes of this show up front. And when we first saw episode four, it wasn't finished. It was like just a little bit better than a work print, basically. But like initially, I was like, all right, this is the best episode of the show. And I feel like things are kind of coming around here. And then watching it today, I was like, no, it's not. Like it just I forgot that it opens with 10 minutes of of Oscar Isaac arguing with himself. And I, I just can't I just can't abide that. And it's unfortunate because all of the other stuff is that cool. Like that mummy is awesome and possibly the most terrifying visual like the MCU has ever produced. Like. <laughs> and it's. <laughs> Andrew's never going to let me live that down, folks. Uh... <laughs> um. But no, I do get it. I do get it. And and the the while well, we're seeing vibe a lot this episode, but like the vibe, <laughs> like during all of those scenes, is more of what is more of what I want, even though it is not more of what I expected from a Moon Knight show. You know, so I can get behind all that. 
And and like I said, I have a tolerance for Stephen Grant, which means that I have a high, much higher tolerance for Stephen Grant than the rest of you do. And all of that, even the stuff that you mentioned of him arguing with it, I I like I like a good superhero love triangle. And we're getting that in this. It's a different take on the whole, you know, in love with Clark Kent or Superman or sort of thing. That's where it's the same guy. It's it's cool. It's good stuff. Alec, as a fellow Stephen Grant hater, please help me out. Um, I like Stephen. Well, like is a strong word. <laughs> I, I tolerate him. Look, I'm just I'm tired, man. <laughs> for 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 three weeks now. Um, you know, we, we've talked, I, I feel like fairly articulately, articulately, as I say, inarticulately, <laughs> and fairly about, you know, what is working on the show and what is work, what isn't working. Um, I feel like we've, you know, offered up alternatives that the show, the routes the sh show could have gone down. I feel like we've been, you know, like fairly constructive and fair, which is good because we're in the, the analysis and criticism business. Um, and we should look at things with kind of a analytical and critical eye and offer up alternatives for how things could be better. And people are working hard on this show. But at a certain point, there's just a good or bad binary. Like at a certain point, it's just yay or nay. Um, and as of this episode, I'm just so firmly in the nay camp. And it's getting <laughs> kind of more tiring to explain why. <laughs> just because like, at some point, if something's not working, it's not working. And I could explain why, and we have before in depth, um, or I could just react as a consumer and say yay or nay. And I, I, nay, it's just, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the best version of this show and the story that could have been. I think it's a missed opportunity. I hate to agree. Um, you know, I, I really don't like dismissing marvel stuff live action superhero stuff like i really try and 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 love as much of this stuff as i reasonably can while also still being an actual critic you know what i mean without just being like a shill for all this stuff but i think i messaged kirsty while i was while i was watching the episode this morning and i think i just like flat out said i'm like i'm sorry this is this is bad tv <laughs> like this is just this is just bad tv i can't do it anymore like i i um there's just too many question marks. There's too much of like, I don't understand why we should care about this character losing their powers because we never got to see them doing anything with their powers to begin with. Like there's clearly an entire superheroic Moon Knight history that we didn't get to see and that we're never going to get to see. If this is Layla's origin story as the new Moon Knight, I'm very into that, but they haven't, really like they're so busy playing the mystery box game that they're not giving us enough to to grab onto with that either and it's it's frustrating it's really frustrating and the the jokes don't land um stephen grant is ill-advised even the like yeah like you know hero loses his powers thing that trope was tired in Superman 2 in 1980, you know what I mean? Like, and, and the thing is you have to earn that. Like that's a second, you know, that's a, that's a second beat in a trilogy thing, a tired one, but nevertheless, and you got to earn that. And they never bothered earning that. They never bothered making us care about any of these characters or anything that's going on in this world. The fact that it's so far removed from the MCU should be a good thing, should be something that I applaud because you know what? There is something to be said for the criticism sometimes that the, that the, that the MCU is a little masturbatory and like, you know, it's constantly setting up the next thing and you have to have seen 20 things to understand what you're watching right now. And I get that, you know, but like this is so far removed. So it doesn't even have that cool stuff to lean on. And it's not giving us any reason to care about its main character at all. Like I've had it. I've had it. Like today, today broke me. Uh, so Alec was Thank polite. You're screaming. <laughs> yeah, Alec Please. was polite. I've tried to be polite, but I'm done. Like I, I, like they got two episodes to redeem this. I'm rooting for Layla. You know, like if if this ends up where we get a new Moon Knight at the end of this, and it's Layla, I'm here for it because she is she is the best thing about this show. But yeah, I'm out. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let our Moon Knight expert Kirsty uh, 
uh, maybe bring me back down to earth here. Uh, I'm not sure that's possible. But... <laughs> <laughs> You've been flying high for a while, man. Um, yeah, this is um, it's it's a weird episode. I think the structure of it is very odd. Um, you have a p- whole part of the episode that is very much, you know, Layla Tomb Raider. And I love that show. I loved watching it this week. Um, and then you have uh, another part where Stephen is trying to get in Harrow's way and there's sort of a romance going on between Stephen and Layla. And, and that's okay. And the, the romance is quite sweet. And then, you know, we've been talking about this part at the end as though it's a twist or a cliffhanger but really that tends to happen in the last few moments of an episode right they give us a good 10 minutes ish of this happening so it's not really a cliffhanger or something that we would go hang on what like at the last moment that would get us to tune in next week it's not being Um, approached in that way it is setting up that this is the case but it's frustrating in some ways if you're a viewer because you're then you're you're given quite a long time to ask yourself okay if this isn't real if none of the stuff that I've been watching is real in the first three three and a half episodes then what was the point of all that what was the point of sitting through it So we can only assume that this isn't real and that, you know, Mark, Stephen, Jake, whoever, will get back to um, its tomb and complete that. And so then this feels quite frustrating to get through so that we can return to the adventure. So those are the two options. And I say this as somebody who is a huge fan of the Jeff Lemire run that this, uh, this show is adapting at the end of this episode. Um, it just feels like structurally misinformed to me um and that those are my issues however that there are there is stuff that I did love about the episode and I do find like I'm having a bit more tolerance for Stephen as this is going along I don't know if it's like a Stockholm syndrome type of thing where (laughs) I'm just I've just relented and I'm just letting it wash over me um yeah just a mixed bag really the whole series has been a mixed bag for me and I really do hope these last two episodes have um got more cohesion joe you mentioned that this is based on uh you said did you say this was your favorite run of moon knight comics oh yeah yeah the jeff lemire uh greg smallwood run from 2016 yeah it's um and 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 i i wonder if part of it is part of my appreciation of of the episode comes from my love of that run because i'm i'm hearing the questions you're raising particular mike uh, about why you should care about this character and what's the um latch on to and then Kirsty mentioning this kind of issue of reality um and i and i think that comic addresses all of those issues specifically great scott specifically the um issue of reality and identity you know um the reason that i've cared about the character so far it has had nothing to do with his powers you know i i i I, my least favorite parts of the show thus far have been when he's moon knight um in part because i kind of feel like moon knight has a fairly generic power set so i don't know what they could do that i haven't seen before um for me the interesting thing is this whole question of reality and identity you know waking up one day and discovering that that you are not who you thought you are that's always going to be compelling to me um especially again steven's working better for me than he is for other people but the this idea that this um, timid, quiet museum shop worker has in fact this other identity that he doesn't even know about that is some hardcore mercenary. <clears throat> and the tension between the two of them about kind of deciding what type of person he's going to be. The, um, I don't know how much of this I should say right now because it looks, I, I wrote an explainer on Den of Geek for the fourth episode of kind of what's going on there. So. I'm going to be way more articulate there because Kirsty edited it and made me sound smarter than I am. Um, but in in that um, in that comic run that they're alluding to, all of those issues are addressed, where it becomes no longer that Mark Spector is broken or that his mental 
position is even an illness in the way that the, the, the comic approaches it. And therefore, reality isn't quite what you think it is. Um, and so it's it, it for me, it's not a matter of is this real what we're looking at in the, the mental hospital or is Egypt real? Um, they're they're all equally real. You know, they're all they're all um, states of reality. And what we're potentially seeing is Mark, Stephen, hopefully Jake, um, sort of coming to terms with that and asserting control over that. And I find that a really fascinating way to go uh, with the kind of standard questions of superheroes, which are, you know, identity, power, et cetera. There's potential here, and I'm definitely giving it the benefit of the doubt, but there's potential here for this to do something very different about those questions that, that I don't think has been answered quite as much. So I'll shut up now and you guys can tell me why I'm wrong about that. But <laughs> I mean, that is kind of what Harrow says, right? Like about, about the nature of psychic reality. So I, I do think you're onto something. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a minute since I read, that, read those comics. But in the comics when mark wakes up and suddenly he's in an asylum and everybody that he knows you know like all the moon knight supporting characters are just kind of like other inmates there wasn't that ultimately because Kanshu was trying to like claim his body right so is that potentially what's happening here like what is at the root of the delusion that you know Kanshu who's now been imprisoned you know, and can no longer influence things as directly as he was in previous episodes. You know, could this be Kanchu finally saying, I'm done with these multiple, you know, with this guy partitioning his personality so that he doesn't have to fulfill his obligations to me. I am just going to take his body. Is that a potential thing that's happening here? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, in the comic run, Stephen Mark turns that around and, um, embraces you know his multiple personalities as uh, it doesn't let Kanchu push him around in that way and so again benefit of the doubt here but I, I, I if it goes that direction I really hope they continue um, with the the comic laid down and and give us something interesting about his mental health it's interesting what you say about him embracing his multiple personalities and we touched on this last week with the with the notion that there is another element of Mark's personality who is yet to be properly seen on screen. And that's Jake Lockley. And after, is it before or after Mark and, uh, and Steven reunite, but there is another sarcophagus that is like chained up and like, yeah. And, and nobody's getting out of that one. That has to be Jake. And given another exchange of dialogue elsewhere in the episode, you know, it makes me wonder if if Jake is even more unsavory than uh, than anybody has been led to believe, even you know, even in the comics so far. Yeah, well, we've seen Jake be uh, certainly a lot more of a darker identity than he is in the comics in this show so far. Um, in moments where Mark and Stephen haven't been in control of their body. There's been a lot made in the last couple of episodes about this backstory of Mark being involved um, in Layla's father's death at an archaeological dig. Um, And our own Gavin Jasper raised the possibility today that is it possible that um, instead of in the comics where Mark's partner was the violent one who, you know, was the ringleader on in that situation, that perhaps if we haven't heard of any casting for that role so far, is it perhaps Jake that has oh. been the one to kill Layla's father and Mark doesn't remember that it happened or... Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, the idea that the that Jake, the Jake identity is just um, basically a villain, and then you have these sort of three, you know, shades inside Mark, which is you know, perhaps Mark is the sort of murky middle, Stephen is the the lighter side, and Jake is the, is the darkness. Um, it would be interesting to see if if this was something that actually. Uh, transpired in the show it's a great theory i think yeah i would i'd be very into this um you know and it's another case of like the show there are cool concepts at work there are great ideas at play here 
I'd love to see how they're going to land that with only two episodes to go. Um, right. And, you know, it's you raise an interesting question, Kirsty, as to whether Mark remembers that or not. You know what I mean? Like, mm. given how the body swaps have gone for the most part, these personalities are generally not aware of each other until recently. That seems to be the impression, um, you know, or maybe this is one thing that he does remember and it might have kind of led to the further fracturing of his personality and the unconscious creation of Steven in order to prevent exactly that kind of thing from happening again. Because like, here's Mark Spector, who is, who is a hard man to begin with, but there's lines that even he would not cross. And he committed, you know, if this is the case, committed a genuine atrocity by by executing an archaeologist in an entire dig. Um, and that was enough to like really break this guy. Um, I don't know. It's interesting, but the problem is that we only have two episodes to go and there's so much story. There's so many things going on and and some of them are landing and some of them aren't, but it's it's moving along so quickly that we don't really have time to, you know, really dwell on any of this or explore any of it properly and I just wish this was had more episodes I talked about this in my review but if you if you if you remember Legion if you watched Legion um they spent time on exploring this stuff and there was nuance and you know the characters were were filled out and felt real and sometimes like I think Alex said before it really does feel like the these characters just being pushed from one thing to another and there's one big thing happening after another and we don't really have time to get to know the characters themselves or have it feel meaningful to us so I really do hope that it comes together in those last two episodes I like I I really do but I'm I'm a bit worried. Any predictions for these last two episodes? Alec, you've been too quiet. <laughs> I mean <laughs> I don't know about predictions. I will look I'll, I'll I'll register one final complaint, I guess. As, as like a non comic book reader, I like I, I I guess I feel maybe annoyed with people with Moon Knight fans in the way that he was pitched to me, because like Going into the show knowing nothing about Moon Knight, I would hear like, you know, he's funny. He's like uh, Marvel supernatural Batman. He's quippy. I saw that uh, viral panel from the comic in which he says like, Dracula, I know you're down there, you nerd. Going to get him. <laughs> and I, there's just none of that came to the screen. And instead I just got mummies. So many mummies. It's just like <laughs> watching other Marvel movies now. It's like going to be all I can think about. Like rewatching like Captain America: Civil War. I just know that there are mummies out there somewhere in the world <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> um, that's our predictions for these last two episodes. Um, I will say you were mentioning earlier that uh, in the comics uh, that that uh, fabricated mental hospital area was Conchu kind of like invading Mark and Steven's mind. I'm wondering if they've changed it around to Amit for the show, just because Conchu's kind of locked away in his little figurine off in the the, the tomb, and the Amit figurine is actually on um, Mark's person right now when he fell under the water. So may, that's a twist that I would predict, I suppose. Um, and I would like it if this did end with um, Layla Moon Knight, as we've all been wanting, uh, because she continues to grow on me week after week. Uh, but yeah, that's all I got for the last two. Joe, how about you? I predict that you guys are going to apologize when you watch episode mm -hmm. five because it's going to be brilliant <laughs> and you're going to say like this is lost leftovers level of brilliant television. Um, no, I, I mean, again, I'm hopeful that it will flesh out the themes that are laid out by this, by the comic it's drawing from and by the potential of the... Um, uh, of the the hospital setup, I am worried that we'll get like ten more minutes of hospital, and then it'll snap back to Cairo, and it'll be kind of a traditional, you know, superhero punch the bad guy sort of thing. So, I, I'm not confident enough to make a a prediction, but I'm hoping for one and fearing the other. 
Look, I hope you're right. I hope we are apologizing to Joe next week. I really do. Like, I really, really do. Like, I want to be wrong. Like, I always want to be wrong when I get like this. I promise you. Kirsty, as our as our other Moon Knight expert, any any thoughts on what might be coming? No. <laughs> no. I I couldn't have predicted when when we got ready to watch this show and we were getting super hyped about it, um, there were things that I thought it might be about. And I, I've i just given up like trying to <laughs> project like my own version of what might happen on this show now. I'm just letting it wash over me and uh, hopefully there'll be a positive result at the end. Unlike Alec, I do want more mummies because that was an awesome mummy. Like that was that was like a great, that was a great live action mummy. Like I want more, I want more mummies in general in pop culture. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, Fred, that was, uh, I will, uh, that was a pretty cool mummy. The sound design in particular, like the weird, like guttural sounds it made was pretty chilling. It was terrifying. It. it was great. Like, you know, it was, it was kind of, again, that was another thing that I expected more, you know, I expected more of that vibe throughout this show, like not just with mummies, obviously with werewolves, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, like if, if this is an indicator of how Marvel is potentially going to handle horror stuff going forward with Werewolf by Night, with Blade, you know, I'd be really into that. You know, so um, bring it. But I also will will not uh, be clowning myself by making predictions that uh, that I'll probably be wrong about. But I love that you won't be clown yourself by making predictions, and yet you asked us to do this. Yeah. <laughs> You're just quite happy to see us be clown ourselves. <laughs> no, it's because after I asked, I realized it was a fool's errand, and I, and I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to the three of you and to it's our. It's too audience. late now. We we've, we've we've been clowned ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> the clowning has come. <laughs> See, but I feel like the difference is nobody's going to call you out if you're wrong. They're going to call me out because I'm the one who's come for this show the hardest. So, like, <laughs> so, you know, all right, fair. No, all right. My big prediction, Kirsty, mm. uh, my, my big prediction is I, I do think that we are headed for a new avatar of Conchu before the show is over. Uh, I just don't think you kind of tease all this stuff with Layla and make Layla as cool and competent as and badass as they've made her. And, you know, the fact that Oscar Isaac has not signed the typical long-term Marvel Studios contract, it just kind of feels to me, and especially if that Jake Lockley theory is correct, which kind of then makes this character almost irredeemably broken. Um, I do think we're going there. I don't think we'll get it next week, but we may get it in episode six. And you know what? Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe uh, maybe I will be apologizing to Joe after episodes five and six. <laughs> I, I, I hope that is the case. Uh, but I think that is it for this week's Marvel Standom, folks. Before we go, just want to remind everyone who is watching on Twitch right now that you should come right back to this very channel on Friday, April 22nd, that's this Friday, at 7.30 Eastern, for an episode of Sci-Fi Explosion, which will feature a sci-fi show and tell cooking tips from the Alien Cookbook. Yes, you heard that right. And all kinds of fun retro sci-fi weirdness. Um, for real, uh, Sci-Fi Explosion kept me going during the dark days of lockdown last year. So we are thrilled to host them right here at Den of Geek. Tune in, it is a lot of fun. There's usually like a, a fun crowd. Like it's, it's just a fun way to spend a Friday evening. Come hang out, I'll be there in the chat as well. We will be back again next Wednesday where, God help us, we will break down Moon Knight Episode 5 and unpack all the other happenings in the MCU. Make sure you're subscribing to us wherever you're listening right now. Don't forget to check out our web home at denigeek.com where you can find all our Marvel and Moon Knight coverage. That's denigeek.com slash Marvel. Drop us a line. Let us know your burning questions and what you want us to cover in upcoming episodes. We are at Marvel Standom on Twitter and Instagram. Give them a follow because we'll have some surprises there eventually. If you came in late, you'll be able to watch this entire episode on DennyGeek.com or at our YouTube home, DennyGeek US. Don't forget, you can check out past episodes there and also wherever you get your podcasts. 
Joe, thank you once again. Hope to see you again soon. Uh, folks, make sure you are reading Joe George's byline over on denigeek.com. He's a fantastic writer. We're lucky to have him. Thank you to our brilliant and patient producer, Andrew Halley, for making us look good, except for when he's roasting me. Thank you to Denny Geek social media coordinator, Ruby Parham, for making sure you all behave in the comments. Special shout out to Michael R. for making the podcast version of this show all it can be. And most of all, thank you all for watching. This has been Marvel Standom on the Denny Geek Network. And until next time, remember, folks, we stand together. Mmm.